It's official. I know. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We're going to just give it a minute and let people move from the panel to back to the main stage, and then we'll get started with our keynote. All right, everyone. Um, first, as a logistical reminder, um, after our keynote, we'll be having closing remarks and we'll be doing the final raffle. And I don't know if they announced the prize, but it's it's, it's a big prize. Um, and um, as we approach the end of the conference, again, I am so honored to introduce our featured keynote. Um, I will be introducing Dr. Michelle Morris, and I will read her entire biography because it's also always worth recognizing someone who is pushing the movement of equity, um, despite like the difficulties that that ensues and that comes from there. In 2021, Dr. Morris was named the first chief medical officer of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Morris is an internal medicine hospitalist, co-founder of Equal Health, and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. Equal Health is a nonprofit organization that builds critical consciousness and collective action globally in the pursuit of health equity for all. She was previously the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Partners in Health and now serves on the PIH Board of Directors. In 2015, Dr. Morris worked with several Equal Health partners to find the Social Medicine Consortium, a global coalition that seeks to use activism and disruptive pedagogy rooted in practice and teaching of social medicine to address the miseducation of health professionals on the root causes of illness. Amazing. In 2018, Dr. Morse was awarded as a Soros Equality Fellowship for working with colleagues to launch Equal Health Global Campaign Against Racism. In September 2019, she began a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Policy Fellowship in Washington, D.C., and worked with the U.S. House of Representatives Ways and Means Committee majority staff on health equity priorities. As a Howard Hyatt Global Health Equity resident in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital from 2008 to 2012, Dr. Morris worked in Haiti, Rwanda, and Botswana. She focused her international work in Haiti, where she helped to coordinate Partners in Health earthquake relief efforts, was a first responder for the cholera epidemic, and worked on women's health and quality improvement projects. Dr. Morris earned her BS in French in 2003 from the University of Virginia, her MD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in 2008, 
and her MPH from the Harvard School of Public Health in May 2012. So thank you, Dr. Morris, and feel free to take it away. Thank you so much, Chi Chi. Thanks um, everyone for having me. Uh, it's a real honor to get to be with you, especially as a proud Philadelphian from West Philly, actually, um, and someone who went to med school um, back home in Philly as well. It's really great um, to get to, to spend a little time with you on this Saturday afternoon. I'm gonna share my screen and um, just share a few ideas with you all about some of the things that I've been grappling with and working on for many, many years now, um, many of which uh, I think will be familiar to you um, and many of which uh, I kind of embarked upon before um, moving to New York City about 14 months ago to start my new role as the inaugural chief medical officer and also as the deputy commissioner for the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness. So with that, let's just uh, jump right in. I'm going to be talking about a more just future for medicine and public health in the COVID era. And hopefully this will be familiar to all of you since you're either physically or virtually in Philadelphia, I guess. Um, uh, the most difficult social problem in the matter of Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation towards the well-being of the race. There have been, been few other cases in the history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. Again, the groundbreaking social epidemiologic study by one of the first ever social epidemiologists in the history of the world, W.B. Du Bois, um, in, published in the Philadelphia Negro in 1899. And I suspect, unfortunately, that if Du Bois saw where we are today in 2022, he might have the same exact concern, unfortunately. Um, so I want to talk a little about critical race theory and how it is helpful in medicine and public health, uh, and specifically in the case of COVID-19. I'm going to talk a little about race explicit strategies um, and what happens when you use them. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about reparations and anti-racism. So I just want to offer three contextual slides before I get into those points. The first, I, I suspect, is familiar to all of you because these forces, these levels of determinants or forces that shape health are far more well uh, acknowledged and understood now than they were even just five or 10 years ago, which is progress. Oh, sorry. You guys, can you not see my slides? No, we can't. I think you need to uh, share the presentation versus the PowerPoint app. So if you go to share again. Okay, let me do stop sharing. Let's see. So try it again, share, mm -hmm. and then share screen. And then share a certain element of your screen. So that should be the presentation slide, like the main slide should come up. Window. Okay, let's try it again. How about now? So um, if you, have you clicked presentation? I can. Okay. You mean in the PowerPoint? Yes. In PowerPoint, click slideshow. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about now? Yeah, so we're not seeing that. So if you click share again, you can click on the slideshow, I think. That's how we're able to do it on our end. Let's see. Hmm. Um, how about that? No, we Not can't working. see it. No, I'm sorry. So um, if you click. Let me try stop sharing one more time. Hmm. That's so odd. I thought that it seemed to work before. Should I try video? Thought? No, that shouldn't do it. Share. I'm, I'm clicking share screen. Should I just do entire screen? Is that better? That will that will work. Yes. And then how about that? Okay. So now, yes, we can see it. And is it advancing? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Thank. Of course, thanks. So, um, so, so, yeah. I mean, I, I would say that these four layers or levels of forces that determine health are much more well 
acknowledged and described now um, than five or 10 years ago. Um, but particularly because you all are training in medicine, um, I just want to acknowledge and remind you how important it is to acknowledge that the majority of our training is in the biological and behavioral circles. Whereas, as many of you know and believe, it's really the social and structural upstream determinants that shape health outcomes, health behaviors, and, and even the expression of biological um, contexts much more than uh, anything else. And so, but I think we have to have a large dose of humility as health providers and trainees in medicine when we're talking about the social and structural, because it really isn't how our field uh, it was, was developed. Fortunately, those of us who are focused on social medicine, however, really um, uh, believe that it's it's best actually for health, community health, health equity, um, for us to um, study the social sciences and to consider medicine a social science um, as a much more profound um, and appropriate um, framework for how we understand the drivers of health and how we can be actors that help to create the societal conditions and the societal structure um, that allows for health for all. And we also often ignore how much colonialism continues to shape the global geopolitical and global wealth dynamics in the world. COVID has shown us that more than anything, as all of you know, but uh, I rarely see us talking about how much colonialism continues to act uh, in the world today. In fact, uh, as also I'm sure many of you have been looking at and watching and, and been concerned about or outraged about, 80% of people in wealthy countries around the world have been vaccinated, only about 10% of people in poor countries and the lowest income countries around the world have been vaccinated. Only about 5% of the population on the continent of Africa has been vaccinated. And these are uh, inequities that you'll hear lots of people describing the causes of, but we have to understand that even that small example um, around COVID vaccine equity is very much related to the global colonial history and the ongoing wealth extraction by the global north from the global south. And it's just evidence here on this map uh, showing the proportionality of wealth to each country's geography on a world map with uh, you know, obviously profound inequities uh, between global north and global south. Japan is particularly large and dark purple on the right. So the health and social problems index is an interesting way to look at this and bring the same colonial analysis back here to the United States. And, um, you know, our history of settler colonialism and structural racism and enslavement, uh, of course, created the conditions for this kind of inequity. On the y-axis, you see the index of health and social problems, um, which includes various indicators like rates of infant mortality, rates of incarceration, rates of mental illness, social mobility, life expectancy, et cetera. And on the x-axis, income inequality. Uh, and the United States, as you see here, is a huge outlier with the highest rates of income inequality correlated quite directly with the high index of health and social problems. And again, why? Can't we seem to get past this? Uh, I, I would posit again that it's our country's unwillingness to reckon with, acknowledge, and be honest about our history of settler colonialism and enslavement and structural racism. So how can critical race theory help us to understand this and, and how does COVID help us understand this? Um, I know many of you have been um, studying critical race theory, following it. Uh, probably concerned about how the far right has attacked critical race theory, tried to redefine it uh, and use it as a political tool um, to mobilize uh, racist white people across this country for the political uh, agenda um, of the right and of corporations. Um, but it's really important, I think, that we, again, um, as, you know, clinicians and clinicians in training who are trying to understand the social and structural drivers of health and health determinants. We have to look to social sciences, including um, critical race theory, which is a theory that came out of legal studies and legal scholarship, actually, and other social science um, that is incredibly relevant to our work in medicine and public health. And many of you are likely aware of some of the origins of this theory. Um, it really comes out of uh, an attempt, a legal attempt, um, at trying to understand why there were such 
social and civil rights progress during the 1960s in the civil rights movement that was quite rapidly backtracked in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, and why the gains um, that came out of a truly civil rights legal framework, um, a civil rights oriented legal framework in the 60s, why it was so quickly eroded, and why we lost so many of the gains from that era. Uh, and, you know, why American society created that backtracking? What were the forces that led to it? Why uh, did the civil rights movement not solve all of our racial equity and racial justice problems? So um, Derek Bell is one of the many thought leaders behind founding this field. Kimberly Crenshaw, of course, also um, who put forward one of the key tenets of critical race theory, intersectionality, uh, and many others uh, were involved in developing this theory over the past several decades. Um, and race, it, it, one of the tenets of critical race theory is that racism is thoroughly embedded in society, that it's actually so deeply embedded um, such that it's almost invisible in, and we don't even realize how much it's working to shape re how resources are allocated, what choices we're allowed to make, um, what kind of life we lead and even how long we live uh, by race. The social construction of race as a tenet of critical race theory is one that is particularly important and relevant for us in uh, medicine and public health, because um, as we'll talk about, um, if we don't understand that race is socially and politically constructed, it's very easy to start to come up with biological theories about uh, differences in biology between the races, which are, again are uh, you know, it, it harkens back to eugenics and is uh, not uh, based in science by any means, not based in anything other than a racist and white supremacist political agenda. So remembering that race is a social and political construct is critical for us and is a tenet of critical race theory. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, intersectionality being uh, another key tenet that's really about um, the, the power and the challenge behind um, those of us who have multiple identities that are marginalized and how those multiple experiences of marginalization kind of um, sum up to greater than the parts uh, in terms of the experience of oppression and marginalization in a society like the United States. And if you also have uh, looked at critical race theory, hopefully you've also looked at public health critical race praxis. Um, Dr. Chandra Ford and Dr. Collins Irene Bua uh, developed this framework and theory applying critical race theory to public health. Uh, and some of the key tenets in their application of it uh, are that science is not objective, um, which is a, a very bold, very important, and very true claim, right? Because if racism is thoroughly embedded in society, then racism shapes even the research questions that we're asking. Um, and I think that that's a very important and very radical uh, theory to put forward. Um, and then also the way that we make progress, how do we make racial prog prog progress according to public health critical race praxis, um, is that we have to actually generate knowledge outside of our discipline's core knowledge base. And that's what uh, many of us and many of you have been involved in, in demanding uh, de-implementation of race adjustment or race correction in clinical algorithms. It's a great example of actually saying to our discipline, this is wrong, even though this has been accepted as standard of practice, uh, you know, to have a race adjustment for Black people in how we calculate kidney function, for example, that's been standard accepted practice for decades, uh, and yet it's wrong. And we had to do research outside of the usual channels in order to prove the harm of a practice like that. So um, these two theories, I think, help us tremendously in understanding ways that we see racial inequities play out in health. And so here's a great example. Um, I'm not sure what this map looks like for Philadelphia, but I suspect that a heat map could be generated showing uh, the places in the city that have the highest rates of vaccination versus the lowest on the left, uh, as you see for New York City, and on the right by race. And uh, what we still see in the city is that the Black vaccination rate is significantly lower than all of the other races. And, you know, some people who maybe haven't uh, understood rate, uh, critical race theory or haven't invested the time in understanding it, some people would look at this and say, oh, what's wrong with the Black people, right? Um, although you also probably see that the white vaccination rate is also low. Um, and there's a lot of victim blaming that happens when you project racial inequities like this, right? Um, we often leave it to people to come up with their own explanation for why there are racial inequities. 
And what critical race theory helps us to understand is oh, we shouldn't project these inequities without explaining why they exist. And uh, many of you know that uh, for black folks, um, there has been a long standing history of medicine and public health not being trustworthy institutions actually uh, actively excluding people of color, especially black people from access. Um, and actually, when we do access uh, these services, we often have bad experiences. And so um, there was a study by the Commonwealth Fund just last year that showed that Black and Latinx people had tremendously high rates of reporting experiences of discrimination when they accessed healthcare, uh, and many other things, right? Like the fact that misinformation about the COVID vaccine has actually been unfairly targeted towards communities of color, especially Black communities. So with all those things to put together and a history of structural racism as we know in this country, it's not hard to explain why the Black vaccination rate's been lower, but it's on us to fix it, right? It's on us to be trustworthy. It's not on uh, Black people. Um, and the more we uh, get away from victim blaming and actually you know, doing the work of restitution and healing, the more likely we are to not see these kind of inequities going forward. Um, and specifically, how can we use race conscious approaches to address this? I'm going to talk about that quite a bit for the next few minutes. But I wanted to give a, an unlikely example from Vermont, uh, where Vermont, which doesn't have a lot of Black people or people of color, they actually opened up um, eligibility to the COVID-19 vaccine for Black, Indigenous, and people of color populations before other groups. And even though it looks uh, based on the right, like that didn't necessarily help Indigenous people or Pacific Islanders, it did actually lead to a pretty high rate of vaccination for Blacks. And again, it's, it's because we know that Black people were disproportionately harmed during COVID in terms of cases, hospitalization, and death, what Vermont said was we should open up vaccination to them first because that would be equity, right? That would be a race conscious approach to allocating the COVID-19 vaccine. And that's what they did. And at least for Black people in Vermont, that worked. Of course, there was a tremendous white supremacist backlash against the governor of Vermont, who happens to be a Republican because of this policy. Uh, and as you see on the left there, he, he defended it. He said, this is what equity looks like. In fact, all of the vitriol is racism, uh, which is kind of surprising to see from a Republican, to be frank. Um, but you guys have also probably seen um, COVID therapeutic prioritization schemes. New York State actually uh, issued a prioritization scheme that allowed clinicians to prioritize um, Black, excuse me, uh, specifically non-white race or Hispanic ethnicity, those groups were allowed to be prioritized in who got uh, treatment with monoclonal antibodies and antivirals like Paxlovid um, because of the history of longstanding inequities. That was the explanation that was given in the New York State guidance. Uh, and it was because not only did New York State know that Black and Hispanic uh, people, excuse me, people of color and Hispanic people were specifically more likely to experience harm and an unfair burden of COVID. But they also saw this data on the right from the CDC, which showed actually that when you look uh, by race at who is getting treated with monoclonal antibodies, Black, and, Black people and Asian people and other people of color and Hispanic people specifically have much lower rates of getting access to this uh, life-saving treatment. And you know, again, this is one of the many reasons why race and ethnicity should be used um, to determine who gets access when. And yet again, uh, if you think about the definition of racism and the solutions to racism, it should be resources according to need. That's how Dr. Kamara Jones describes some of the solutions to racism is that we should be allocating resources based on need. And, uh, and that is what these policies do, even though they are race uh, explicit. So uh, let's not be uh, naive, of course, COVID is not race blind, right? COVID has not been colorblind in its impact by any means. Uh, so our solutions should be race conscious for sure. Um, and when you look at the, the changes in life expectancy and uh, uh, another study just came out in the past couple of days uh, was covered by the Washington Post as well, um, showing that this life expectancy gap has gotten even worse. Um, but if you compare 2019 and 2020, we'll just note, of course, that baseline, Black people still had the lowest life expectancy even before COVID hit. And then we suffered uh, unfairly 
um, inequitable impacts. So black people lost an average of 2.7 years of life expectancy. Ex Hispanics lost almost two years and white people lost a year. Everyone suffered, but that suffer was not, suffering was not equally distributed. So what happens when we try to use race explicit strategies, again, since we know um, that uh, impacts and harm and exposure to risk are not experienced um, uh, equally across society, they are experienced in a very racialized pattern. And so how can we uh, use race conscious and race explicit strategies to advance uh, racial equity, health justice, uh, and health equity? Um, well, let's just take a quick look at the kidney function experience. And I know many of you have been doing this work. Um, in 1999, um, the modified diet in renal disease equation for calculating estimated glomerular filtration rate was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, and it specifically stated if black multiply by 1.21. And then in CKD Epi, which was an updated version, a, a larger uh, database was used and an updated version of that MDRD equation was developed uh, and, and published in 2009. That's the CKD Epi equation. It still had the black race modifier and said, if black multiplied by 1.159. Now the question here is what is black, right? Uh, and again, huge publications change the like the the spectrum, the kind of trajectory of uh, kidney disease and uh, kidney studies for decades. Um, but when you look a little closer under the hood for that original MDRD study in 1999, only 197 black people were included, and it wasn't even clear how black was defined. They uh, said in that study actually that ethnicity was assigned by the study personnel. It was not a uh, self-disclosed or uh, self-described um, race and ethnicity that was used in that study. And it was only 197 quote unquote black people. And it ended up uh, setting the standard for kidney function calculation for you know hundreds of millions of black people all over the world in fact, which is quite scary. And how did they explain the use of this race modifier in the equation? Well, according to those researchers, this was the most objective way to do it. Their regression model suggested that using the black modifier would make the equation more accurate for quote unquote black people. And yet what they were doing was advancing and normalizing a biological definition of race that we all know is inaccurate and untrue. Um, now, why did they explain that this needed to be done? Well, their explanation was, we think black people maybe have more muscle mass and these three studies maybe proved it. They quoted these three uh, very, very um, uh, unsatisfactory studies uh, that were not really scientific or rigorous by any means. And they were also making this assumption, making this claim that, again, there was a biological difference between Blacks and whites, and that it was related to Black people having greater muscle mass, which is a racist trope that goes back to enslavement in the you know, 16, 17, 1800s that white doctors put forward saying you know, that black people somehow uh, had greater muscle mass. This is, uh, you know, again, how modern medicine is shaped by the history of white supremacy in medicine in ways that we don't wanna believe or talk about uh, or acknowledge. And yet we have to make these changes. This is not the kind of medicine we should be practicing in the 21st century. So what's the bottom line on this kidney function question? Well, what we also know is that race adjustment using that modifier for quote unquote black race makes uh, black kidney function look healthier than white kidney function for any other measured creatinine. Uh, it likely leads to a delayed diagnosis of chronic kidney disease and delayed referral to nephrology. Um, and we also know that there are existing profound inequities in chronic kidney disease between black people in this country and everyone else. In fact, we have a lower prevalence of stage one and two kidney disease amongst blacks and a higher prevalence of end-stage renal disease, four times higher prevalence than whites. And you can imagine that because of this race corrector, a big part of that trend it, and the uh, rapid progression from early stages to late stage kidney disease in Black people could be because of delayed referral, delayed diagnosis, delayed evaluation for transplant because of race correction. Um, and this is a huge, huge movement. I know many, again, of you are probably involved in this work. Um, I had the honor of co-founding an organization called Equal Health back in 2010. And we, in 2018, 
um, launched a um, campaign, a global campaign against racism in partnership with Dr. Kamara Jones. Uh, the Nashville chapter of our campaign worked for two years to eliminate uh, and de-implement race adjustment in kidney function calculations. And were successful in July, 2020 of doing that after again, two years of work um, in large part because of the window and the, the momentum that came out of the um, just absolutely unreal murder of George Floyd in May of 2020. And professional societies, uh, where do they stand on this? Well, some of them have kind of come to terms with it. Um, the American Society of Nephrology has said, yes, we understand this is uh, a problem because it makes race look biological, which it's not. The American Thoracic uh, Society has said that lung function, which is another area of race adjustment that happens, uh, in spirometry tests, they also acknowledge that actually, uh, you know, by correcting, quote unquote, correcting spirometry for race, it normalizes and uh, institutionalizes uh, inequities uh, and differences in lung function that are probably from uh, actually the, the lived experience and the environmental and other uh, impacts of structural racism on lung function and lung disease, but other professional societies have refused to re-examine this practice, unfortunately, uh, such as the case with the Society of Thoracic Surgery. Um, so let's talk about one more example, and then um, we'll talk about reparations, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So just one more example of race explicit strategies. Heart failure uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I trained at Brigham from 2008 to 2012 and then was a faculty member there uh, from 2012 and ever since. Uh, although I'm, I'm not practicing there anymore, I, I still hold my academic title um, through Brigham and Women's and am very much still connected to this work. Um, but back in 2016, many of you probably remember that summer when Philando Castile and Alton Sterling were murdered. And one of the things that followed um, those um, horrific murders by police was that the trainees, residents, medical students, um, staff at Brigham and Women's really demanded change. And what they said was, we wanna see this hospital commit to health equity and racial justice. And I was asked to co-chair the Department of Medicine Health Equity Committee at that time. And one of the first projects we took on, actually, this is one of the ideas that uh, Dr. Brom Wispelway put forward, who I know was presenting just, just before this session. Um, the two of us, Brom and I worked together on this um, really important study um, where, you know, Brom and many others were saying, you know, it does seem like we've got mostly white people on our cardiology service and mostly black and brown people on our general medicine service. And what we did was we looked into the quality of care and the outcomes. We found that for the patients with heart failure on our cardiology service, they were, uh, the cardiology patients were more likely to do cardiology follow-up and the readmission rates for heart failure for patients on the cardiology service were much lower than on the general medicine service. And so we, we wanted to study this and look at the data and see if it actually bore out. And what we, what we did was we looked at 10 years of data of patients with heart failure who were admitted through our emergency department uh, and then hospitalized for their heart failure. We, we found actually that it was true that looking at over 3000 admissions for heart failure um, and heart failure is the number one most common primary admission for all of the patients at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And so we actually found that, uh, you know, white patients were systematic more likely, uh, systematically more likely to be admitted to the cardiology service and that black patients uh, and Latinx patients were systematically more likely to be admitted to the general medicine service. And of course, um, this also, uh, this finding, uh, again, which you'll see here with the adjusted rate ratios for Blacks and Latinx patients in the top, when we looked at our multivariate um, regression analysis, and then also when we looked at rate ratios for admission to cardiology, we, we also looked using propensity matched cohorts. And through both methodologies, both analyses showed over and over again Blacks and Latinx folks were less likely to go to cardiology. And this was regardless of insurance status. This had nothing to do with the rates of comorbidities. Uh, and of course, it was a compounding cycle um, because the more you went to medicine, the more likely you were to go to medicine in the future and the more likely you were to be readmitted. 
so we wrote about this in the New England Journal. I had the chance to write this article with our department chair for the Department of Medicine uh, at Brigham, Dr. Jill Lascauzo. And we talked about the fact that it was the Black Lives Matter movement that really created the window for change and a real meaningful conversation in our institution about institutional racism. Because what we said was, uh, this is an example of institutional racism, right? It's uh, actually a racialized pattern of who gets access to a particular resource which is the cardiology service. So this is institutional racism. We have to treat it as such and we have to address it. We can't just study it. We actually have to fix it. And so in order to try to fix it, we did a survey of the providers in the emergency department. Chi Chi was a co-author on this study. We did have to end it early because of COVID and didn't get to survey as many clinicians in the emergency department as we wanted, but still the trend showed that actually when we ask the clinicians, how are you making the decision about where the patient with heart failure goes to cardiology or to general medicine? The clinicians said that, well, white patients are more likely to advocate for themselves to go to the cardiology service and that that advocacy impacted their decision about where to send the patient, which is a very powerful and concerning example of how white privilege can be operationalized. And, uh, and actually turn into uh, and become a driver of institutional racism. Um, and so we sought to put forward a framework to try to fix this. I'm gonna talk about it more in the reparation section, but Brahm and I did publish a article about a year ago in the Boston Review, um, describing a framework called the Healing Arc that builds on the work of Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen um, around reparations. They're pushing for federal reparations, which we believe is needed. Um, but we also feel that we need mechanisms and frameworks for redressing institutional racism, like we found in the example of heart failure uh, patients at Brigham and Women's. And so the healing arc is the framework we put forward. It's acknowledgement, redress, and closure as the three steps to trying to address institutional racism in healthcare. Um, and the redress piece, how did we actually implement this um, at Brigham uh, to try to address racial inequities and heart failure? Well, we implemented a best practice alert in EPIC um, that essentially when a patient who's Black or Latinx comes to the emergency department with heart failure, uh, a notification pops up that says this patient's from a racial or ethnic group with historically inequitable access to the cardiology service. Consider changing the admission to cardiology unless they, these reasons. And so this is one of the ways that we, we hope we'll be able to actually change um, this pattern of institutional racism in heart failure care. Um, it's been implemented, this best practice alert was implemented starting in December of 2021. And we'll be tracking the data to watch very closely um, about uh, what happens to the institutional outcomes for heart failure care. Um, but we experienced a tremendous backlash from right wing news media, on social media, text messages, emails, threats by phone. Uh, unfortunately, there was a massive backlash against this by white supremacists. And our institution, unfortunately, did not have our back in the way we were hoping initially. This backlash really started in the spring of 2021 when we published the Boston Review article, but then happened again in January and February of this year of 2022 when neo-Nazi groups were marching on the lawn of Brigham and Women's Hospitals uh, with pictures of Brahm and I and our names on a flyer saying that we were racist. Um, this is also extended to the American Medical Association. Our colleague, Dr. Aletha Maybank has also experienced um, these threats and backlash. Um, but again, Equal Health uh, and our campaign against racism has been one of the ways that we've continued to organize, start to develop frameworks for rapid response, um, and developed and published statements of support and solidarity for our work, uh, which really allowed us to keep pushing forward despite what has been very demoralizing and, and very uh, unfortunate attacks. So what does reparations help us to do when it comes to racial inequities and health equity? Um, many of you are probably aware of Dr. Kiangi Yamada Taylor's uh, op-ed that was published uh, in June of 2020, um, looking at the trends for six major um, outcomes um, between Blacks and whites uh, over the past six decades, really again showing that this colorblind blind approach that started with the civil rights movement um, has not served Black people well. And in fact, in many ways has led to the ongoing persistence of white supremacy 
And that's what these graphs represent. This is white supremacy by the numbers. Um, when you look at the gaps between black and white in household income, in life expectancy, in home ownership, in incarceration, in unemployment, in completing college, all of these trends show that there may be changes over the past six decades, but the gap between black and white has really not changed. And that is a profound injustice that requires urgent action and new strategies, uh, such as, again, race conscious, race explicit strategies. Um, Dr. Mary Bassett and Dr. Sandro Golea described the case for reparations and how it has positive health impacts. Um, this came out in the New England Journal just about a year ago, and hopefully you guys had a chance to read it. Um, who knew the New England Journal would be publishing anything about reparations, but um, they describe health is produced over the life course and across generations. Reparations provided today would be an investment in the future and in reducing disparities that have been intractable for generations. As you've seen on the slide I just showed, uh, intractable for generations. So something has to change. Um, and another example of something changing, again, uh, efforts by medical students, um, folks like yourselves, maybe many of you actually listening today were involved in this. And just this past fall, um, a new equation for EGFR, for kidney function calculation, was published in the New England Journal that does not use race and is just as accurate, if not more accurate, uh, uses creatinine or C-statin C. There's two equations. Both of them do not use race, and both of them should be the new standard. Um, to ensure that Black patients, again, are not systematically uh, less likely to meet the thresholds for referral to nephrologists, referral for transplant evaluation, et cetera. Um, and as I mentioned, our uh, anti-racist agenda for medicine publication described um, this framework called the Healing Arc, Acknowledgement, Redress, and Closure, uh, as an approach to really saying, first of all, if we want to address institutional racism, we need to start by acknowledging the wrong and who was harmed. Second, we have to redress that wrong. Uh, and this is implementation of programs that, again, uh, use a race explicit approach to ensure restitution uh, and to ensure, re ensure redress for whatever that inequity was. In our case for heart failure, um, one of the ways, we have other ways as well, one of the ways was through the best practice alert. Um, and then closure, community dialogue on um, the, the community that was harmed by the policy or practice uh, should be the community that decides when the harm has been redressed uh, and healed. And one of the ways we're doing that, this kind of work, um, race explicit work in New York City is through our coalition to end racism and clinical algorithms. Um, we launched this coalition in my role as chief medical officer last fall. We have 12 institutions across the city, including the six largest health systems in the whole entire city, who have pledged as a part of this coalition, which is going to run for two years, um, to, uh, to achieve three goals. The first goal for all the members of the coalition is to end race adjustment in kidney function, lung function, and vaginal birth after cesarean section. The second goal is to actually track, monitor, and evaluate the racial inequities related to those algorithms. And the third is to implement a patient engagement plan to make sure that patients whose care has been harmed or delayed because of race adjustment actually get the care that they deserve. Um, these are the institutions that are a member of Circa. Again, even these large wealthy academic medical centers that are white led, uh, such as NYU, Northwell, uh, you know, Mount Sinai, they are a part of uh, this coalition. And I wanna say that it's also a part of a trend we've seen in public health policy um, around resolutions and declarations of racism as a public health crisis. This is a policy trend that also uh, took off exponentially after the murder of George Floyd as you see here in May, but the, uh, the original, uh, the first resolution declaring racism a public health crisis was actually conceived of and, and implemented by Lillian Payne, a black woman who was serving at the time as president of the Wisconsin Public Health Association. And that was the first resolution that was ever put out back in 2018 in Wisconsin. Um, in New York City, uh, just a, a few months ago, in October of last year, our Board of Health passed a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis. But what was particularly important about it actually was that it required eight actions 
of us at the health department um, that we have to do, and we have to report twice a year to the Board of Health showing progress on this, um, we have to actually take those actions to interrupt racism and its impact on public health and show that we're making progress uh, to the Board of Health. So this is a policy that holds us accountable. Um, I want to close by just reading a few of the statements from our resolution in New York City. I hope you will Google it uh, as I'm talking and read it. It's only three pages long. Um, I think it's a very clear statement about what is going wrong right now um, with racism impacting health, public health and health outcomes, um, and hope that you'll consider using it in some of the work that you're doing in Philadelphia as well. Um, so, whereas settler colonialism, indigenous genocide, and enslavement of Africans are part of the history of our nation, and whereas these original injustices have been without comprehensive restitution or redress, and whereas racism is a race-explicit system, and anti-racism requires race-explicit strategies, and whereas the work of undoing racism is grounded in love as well as science and civic duty, this love is not sentimental, rather it's what James Baldwin called the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. Uh, these are just a few of the statements from the resolution. Um, and before I close, I want to just mention a study showing what would have happened if we had instituted federal reparations as cash payments to formerly uh, to, to Black American descendants of formerly enslaved people. And it showed actually that if we had done that, COVID transmission would have been reduced by 30 to 68 percent. And it really, again, shows that the legacy of racism and how it impacts wealth and wealth inequities in this country remains one of the most profound uh, inequities that holds us back from achieving health equity. And even 20 years after the publication of Unequal Treatment, this Institute of Medicine report describing racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, again, we have made far too little progress. Um, so thank you again. Uh, thank you to the late Paul Farmer. Thank you to Dr. Jones and all of my other mentors and organizations I'm a part of and, and really look forward to um, hearing from all of you. Um, hopefully you'll have some questions uh, and comments. I'm trying to stop sharing. Hopefully that worked. Um, but really, you know, look forward to um, having your, your questions and comments um, added to the conversation. Uh, and thanks again for the opportunity to be with you. I'm not sure if uh, questions are gonna come in the chat or um, how I should field the questions, but happy to take them as they come. I'll be fielding your questions. So I'll let you know when the first question gets in and then we'll initiate the Q&A. Sounds great. Awesome. Thanks, Chi Chi. Yeah. So we have our first question and Stephen asks, on addressing some of these issues, how do you incorporate the communities affected in these initiatives? Thanks for the question, Stephen. Yes, um, I didn't spend too much time on it, but the Wisdom Council um, is one of the ways that we are doing that work um, in, uh, in Boston around heart failure. And what the Wisdom Council is, is it's essentially kind of a, a, um, a, a group um, that was convened by one of the federally qualified health centers that we work with that um, sends patients directly to Brigham, uh, that's in one of the communities uh, uh, in the Boston area um, that's directly connected to Brigham and Women's. And the leaders of that uh, FQHC worked with us all along to develop uh, all of to develop everything I just talked about to develop the um, heart failure project and uh, to develop the health equity committee um, and many other initiatives and uh, when we got to the point of being able to really prove this example of institutional racism and prove that this inequity 
uh, you know, really needed to be addressed. Um, we started working with, um, with the FQHC, it's called Southern Jamaica Plain Health Center, um, to develop uh, the Wisdom Council as a community-oriented conversation about this inequity, where we presented the data um, about heart failure inequities and racism. Um, and the, the folks who are members of the Wisdom Council are folks who um, themselves either are in the community um, that uses Brigham and Women's Hospital or themselves have experienced or their family members have experienced um, racism, uh, either around heart failure specifically or cardiovascular care. Um, and that Wisdom Council has been meeting uh, for the past six months or so. Um, and it's still in evolution. It's, a, it's again, our attempt at starting to understand um, what redress and closure could look like in this particular example of institutional racism and, and then really trying to use um, the guidance, the, the expertise, the, um, the brilliance, and unfortunately the really difficult experiences of several of the, the members of the council to drive change um, and to um, hold Brigham accountable. So the next question comes from Angela, who is a, she's a first year at Temple, and she's interested in pediatrics. Um, and she's interested to hear how your work with Partners in Health slash Global Health um, integrated or influenced your clinical and administrative work in your current role. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it's a good one. Yeah, I I'll say um, so. When I was a med student back in, I won't tell you what year. <laughs> But but um, one of the one of the things that completely transformed my experience as a med student was uh, was two experiences. One was I got to do a summer internship my first year of med school, um, working with um, a housing first organization that did housing for folks who were suffering from mental illness and substance use and and being unhoused. Um, and it completely changed my understanding um, of how you know, social issues, how marginalization, how racialization, how all of these different forces of oppression influence health outcomes and um, and really opened my eyes. Um, and then the, the second was actually, I had the chance to live in Botswana for a year. I took a year off between my second and third year of med school to live in Botswana and to uh, work as a research assistant doing research on HIV and TB. And at that time, uh, the life expectancy in Botswana was, um, the life expectancy in Botswana at that time was 36 years. And that was because uh, number one, of course, the HIV AIDS pandemic hit the continent of Africa harder than almost any other place. And the world was continuing to extract wealth and oppress and marginalize many of the country, many of the countries on the continent that were hardest hit by HIV. Um, but in Botswana, actually, they achieved independence after uh, uh, or before, I should say, before large diamond reserves were, were found in the country. And the government actually controls those diamond reserves and, and uses the, the, the money that comes in from those diamond reserves to finance a very robust health and social service uh, uh, sector, um, such that, you know, essentially healthcare is free, health insurance is free. And for the first time uh, for any country on the continent of Africa in 2006, Botswana launched a, a national free HIV treatment program. And at that point, um, very few people on the continent were getting treated for HIV, even though many, many people in the US were already being treated. Uh, and it was a huge deal. And that rocked my world to see that happening, to see not only my patients back in Philly as a med student getting treated for HIV with no problem and seeing so few folks get treated in Botswana, but this national program being launched to do so. That really like changed my life. And I, I got very involved in the AIDS movement during that time and worked with ACT UP Philly. I don't know if any of you are involved in ACT UPs. They're still, they're still around and still meet regularly. Um, and they taught me just about everything I know about health justice. And so um, those experiences were really formative for me. Um, and you know, to this day in my work in New York City, those are the things that uh, I always draw on uh, and try to um, continue to lift up and use and understand. I mean, there's unfortunately so many similarities from the AIDS era to what's happening now.
Um, I wish that it weren't the case, but so many of the same things are happening. Um, and so anyways, I, I just uh, am, am thankful I had those experiences as a student and hopefully y'all are finding your way uh, as well to doing that despite the challenges traveling with COVID, whether you're working, you know, again, like I was with for a housing first organization as a student in Westville, or if you're traveling to uh, a country outside the US, no matter where you are, uh, these forces are relevant. Thank you. And you're getting a lot of thanks in the chat as well. And I, I also do remember you speaking, maybe it's been a while, like maybe three years ago, and talking about the balance of like your global health interests with domestic mm -hmm. work here. And there, and I think you made a great point about the people who are doing global health are the people who are also fighting here on the front lines here. And mm -hmm. then, you know, so the passions all kind of tie in together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for your next question. Um, Tiffany asks, and she starts with insightful speech, exclamation point. On the mm -hmm. last slide, you mentioned that if reparations were given, COVID transmission would have been reduced by 30% or 30 or so percent. Mm -hmm. Do you think such data would perpetuate thoughts that minorities spread the disease to its current degree? Mm, fascinating point. Well, it's interesting, right? There's this policy paradox where there was a, a recent study that brought this back to uh, a lot of people's attention again, actually, as well as it, uh, this study it was a so another social science study. It showed that um, when um, COVID data was presented um, and the racial inequities in COVID were presented as a part of it, that actually white people tended to think it was less relevant to them and less important for them. And um, so I do always worry about that paradox, and it's part of the reason why I kind of started off by saying we can't just present disparities and then not explain where they come from and why. Um, we have to really talk about the context in which these inequities and, and health disparities are happening uh, and help folks to understand this is not, again, about Black inferiority or Latinx inferiority or Indigenous people's inferiority. This is about a society that we decided to create uh, in a way that marginalizes and oppresses th these people of color. And so um, I do worry about that. I, I think it's a really valid concern. And at the same time, I think that the ways that that we move forward and still publish data like, you know, this is what would have happened if we had reparations is when we present the inequities, we also describe where they come from, what's the source, why are they being generated, and what is it about our society that's unjust that creates these inequities, not why are Black people inferior or other people of color inferior? I hope that helps. So we have more things and a comment. Thank you, Dr. Morris. This was, an, this was excellent. I learned so much and look forward to reading some of the papers you referenced. And from Kenya, Colvin. Thank um, you. Um, the next question says, you have so much happening, but would love to hear about your work in the past or experience as a student, a medical student. Mm. We have a lot happening to push a change in our medical curriculum to be more equitable. So wondering mm. your thoughts on this. Yeah, man, boy, when I was a student, well, I was lucky, I was honored to get to serve as the co-president of our SNMA chapter at Penn, where I went to med school. I was very uh, in, involved at that time, as I mentioned, both uh, with ACT UP um, and advocacy work, but also um, with huge issues of racism at Penn that continue. I know many of you are, are involved. Some of you may even be involved in the campaign against racism chapter in Philly, if it's still active. But um but I would say as a student, a lot of what I tried to do was um, really organize with my fellow students. The challenge of being a student, of course, is you're there at your institution for a limited amount of time. And sometimes that can feel really, um, I don't know, frustrating, I guess is the word, um, to not have long, a longer horizon to transform your institution. Um, but the way to make sure that, 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 you know, that things don't fizzle I think is to keep organizing within your medical school, keep building as, as new classes of students come, you know, uh, engaging them and building them directly into the efforts and work um, that you're doing. So um, I think that's one way to kind of fight the power as, as a student. And when I was a student, um, I will also say, 
I was the only medical student out of 600 medical students at Penn. I was the only one who was actually from West Philly. And ex I experienced uh, ugly, ugly, discriminatory, uh, stigmatizing, you know, all kinds of nasty um, beliefs from my fellow students about West Philly. I don't know um, how this plays out at Temple, but at Penn, it was like basically like all the white students from medical school lived in Center City. None of them wanted to live in West Philly. They thought it was unsafe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there were all kinds of, you know, ugly terms that were being used for patients from West Philly. Um, I found it to be extremely marginalizing. Uh, and I was, you know, I was both angry, but also nerdy as a medical student. And, and a lot of what I did as a student was using that experience, talking about my experience as someone who's from West Philly at a medical school that's racist and actually like, you know, it's essentially gentrifying the community that I was from. It was a quite an intense experience, but what helped me to move through it was being a part of the SNMA chapter, really getting to know my fellow students and really having a space where we could talk about um, a lot of what we were experiencing. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Um, as, as a current Temple student, I do remember my first day of orientation being shocked by some of the language about our surroundings. Uh -huh. as, as, as infiltrators to the space, our surroundings. Coded language, yep. Mm -hmm. coded language. Um, but um, I am very happy to say that a lot of our students, um, they, we do speak out actively and we work collectively. And hopefully that is part of that transformation and change over time. Yes. yes. So we are over time. So Dr. Moy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so thank much you. for your presentation. Um, I enjoyed it. I always enjoy learning from you. And I know a lot of other people did. Thank you for having me. And good luck with the rest of your uh, conference. And, and again, keep, keep it, you know, just stick together. Medical school can be in a really intense experience. But the more you all stick together and learn from each other and build community, the more powerful you'll be to transform your school. So good luck, um, be in touch, and, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. So we are at the end of the conference. Thank you so much for hanging out and being here to the end. We're going to have the raffle, and then we are going to have closing remarks, or in the other order, in the other way around. So we're going to open that session right now. It is still the main stage. So thank you, everybody, for being here and sticking with us so far. And we're about to wrap up right now and let you on your day.